Great. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are in the world and when, where you're tuning in from. Thank you so much for joining today. Um, I do see some familiar faces and people returning from our previous panel. Uh, thanks for joining the second of the, uh, the panel series on content moderation. Um, today, I'll just go through, I'm one of the executive board members of the Internet Law and Policy Foundry, and I will just give a quick introduction to the Foundry, to um, the this event series, the goal of the series, what we want everyone to take away from this, why we're hosting it, um, and today's specific panel. And then I will introduce our panelists today. Um, if, uh, I'm really excited for the discussion today. I know it's going to be very active discussion and uh, there'll be a lot of great learnings from them. So um, really looking forward to that. And then at about um, 45 past, uh, we'll open it up for audience questions. Um, feel free to uh, send in your questions in chat or if you want to hold on until um, 45 past and ask your questions in, um, in person, you can message me directly. I'm under Nafia Chaldry and um or you can just put it in the chat um to to ping that you want to to speak up uh, but until then i appreciate if everyone kind of holds um uh, stays on mute so yeah so just uh kicking off um this uh, event series has been hosted by the internet law and policy foundry the foundry is a collaborative organization for internet law and policy professionals who are passionate about disruptive innovation uh, the Foundry offers members a platform for professional development, so we host different career series, uh, constructive debate, such as panels, um, such as the one you're attending today, and network building uh, opportunities, a lot of happy hours, which has been at a, uh, at a pause somewhat for the past year, um, and just a lot of, um, and the cohort includes skilled attorneys uh, and policy analysts, all the way from industry to uh, up to government and civil society as well. Uh, we're all eager to help shape the development of internet law and policy. And um, this event has also been sponsored uh, by um, TikTok, Swilgen, and Microsoft. Uh, so thanks to our sponsors for making this happen. Um, so this event series is, the goal of the series is uh, to showcase content governance from different lenses. And today's panel discussion is um, a, a discussion on the prevention of hate online, hate per the definition set by platforms, the community standards, or government's um, efforts by government to regulate uh, at, uh, online hate and, and the importance of the role of civil society, partnership with civil society in protecting vulnerable communities and groups and, uh, and reduce hate online. So just a quick introduction to myself. I'm Nafia. Uh, I'm on the executive uh, executive board of the ILPF, uh, and I recently, uh, fairly recently, graduated from Stanford, studying where I studied public policy. Focused a lot on surveillance um, and online safety uh, and freedom of expression online. And since then, I've been in the trust and safety field, um, working previously working at Facebook, um, and soon to be joining TikTok. Um, and with me today, I have Eric Goldman, Associate Dean for Research, Professor of Law at SEU, um, Ian Levin, Senior Human Rights Advisor at Facebook, and Kate Run, who will be moderating our conversation today, uh, Senior Legislative Counsel at ACLU. So with that, I will pass it to, uh, to our speakers, pass it to Kate to um, take lead on the discussion today. Uh, thanks so much, Nafia, uh, and thanks to everybody for being here. It's, it's, we're excited to talk to you. I think we're going to have a lively discussion today. Um, and the first thing I kind of wanted to say is, I, so is um, I'm going to offer some guiding questions, but I, Ian and Eric are, are, are both incredible experts here, and I, and I absolutely want them to offer whatever they're thinking. So please ignore my question and say what you want if that is, if that is of interest and you think it'll be helpful to the discussion. Um, given the focus of, of what we're talking about today, I wanted to open by asking kind of the first and sort of most fundamental question, and that is, how do we define hate speech? Um, I think that there are a number of definitions out there. There are legal definitions, there are platform definitions, there is human, there are, there is the human right, rights law definition. Um, so I kind of, I wanted to start by, by asking Ian about 
um, his perspective on the definition of hate speech, uh, especially from the social media content moderation perspective. Thanks, Kate, and uh, good to be with you and Eric and uh, Nafir and all. And thank you to the founder for giving me the chance um, to be here. This is an incredibly relevant conversation and, 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 and a challenging one, no question. Um, hey, I mean, one of the, I think, most critical challenges we face um, at Facebook and as part of the human rights team at Facebook thinking about these issues a lot is that while freedom of expression is extremely well defined in international law, Article 19 and Article 20, the limits of, of freedom of expression are well defined. Hate speech itself is is actually not, not defined and, and there is no international consensus on, on what it means. It's, it's in many ways, it's, it's a shorthand phrase as, as David Kay, the former UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression said, um, and, and it's very ambiguity is a problem. It's a problem because it's hard to know how and when legitimately to curtail it. Um, and it's a problem because governments around the world use the vagueness of, of the definition of hate speech, as with fake news and misinformation, to as a pretext for curtailing freedom of speech. And we see that around the world, and I'm sure that we're going to come to that uh, soon. So, you know, it, it is a, a, a challenging question. Uh, question for us. We have a definition um, at Facebook um, of hate speech. It's, it's online. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but just fundamentally what, what, what we're arguing is that we define hate speech as a direct attack against people on the basis of what we call protected characteristics. So that's race, ethnicity, national origin, disability, religious affiliation, sexual orientation, gender identity, and, 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 and so on. So that's how we define it. But obviously, and I'm sure we'll get to talk about this uh, when we talk about uh, enforcement, um, the, the context um, in which uh, speech may or may, may not be hate speech and may or may not uh, contribute to the likelihood of, of, of offline harm, obviously, is going to vary um, a, a lot around the world. Thanks, that's really helpful. Um, and to, to, to contrast with that a little bit, I was hoping maybe I could ask Professor Goldman to talk a little bit about what the legal definition of hate speech might be in the United States. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, and thank you to the Foundry for putting this together and for including me. It's a great honor to be a part of the Foundry's events um, and uh, the, part of the great work that they do. Um, and since you said I could reinterpret the question anyway I want, actually, I'd prefer to talk about what I had for breakfast. Um, so we're going to kind of go back in time. Um, but actually, I just want to go back. What Ian said, I thought was really powerful, that hate speech itself is like a placeholder uh, for um, a bunch of, of antisocial behavior or antisocial interactions. Um, and there's such a wide range of things that can fit under that umbrella that um, talking about hate speech almost invariably involves us talking past each other. Um, here in the United States, uh, hate speech itself doesn't have a legal definition, um, much like Ian was explaining. Um, hate speech is a bundle of different things, some of which may be constitutionally protected, and that I think sometimes catches people by surprise. Um, the things that we, we are confident are not constitutionally protected are things like incitement to imminent violence. So someone is trying to rouse a crowd to go and engage in violence um, uh, imminently, um, uh, that's not constitutionally protected. Um, there's a second order question there. Can you even have that in the online context? Normally we're thinking about uh, uh, like the insurrection on January 6th, where there's someone standing in front of an audience saying, let's go burn this place to the ground, that kind of thing. Um, it's not as easily translate on our environment where we might be all geographically dispersed. Um, there might be a lot of steps between the conversation we're having online and actually going and engaged in imminent violence. One other category thing that can be included in hate speech, which, which can be regulated, um, is the threats saying, I'm going to kill you and saying, I'm going to kill you because of your protected classification that Ian mentioned. Um, that kind of uh, uh, interaction um, can be regulated um, without a uh, foul of the Constitution. But the things that Ian described that Facebook classifies as hate speech, much of that is actually constitutionally protected and off limits from any regulatory intervention at all. Um, so the fact that we engage in this antisocial uh, behavior towards each other, where we treat each other meanly, um, it's a defect of humanity, but it's not something that the government can do anything about under constitutional protection. 
Maybe just to add to what uh, to Eric's really interesting in comments, and just to kind of to help broaden out the conversation, I, and just to say, I'm not a lawyer, so uh, forgive me if I get the law wrong, American or, or, or international. Um, um, I mean, obviously, we're, we're thinking about um, the issue of hate speech across 200 plus countries. We're thinking about it with, I think it's 1.8 billion daily users, and you know, I, I don't know how many billions of, of posts a day. So, some of the challenges that, that Eric talked about, you know, for example, when he referred to January the sixth and speech that was made there, and how we link that speech to the likelihood of, of, of offline harm. Um, so, it's complicated by the fact of. Um, uh, thinking about Ethiopia and Afghanistan and Myanmar and you know, so many others of high, high profile and uh, uh, polarized countries, countries in conflict, countries uh, facing elections and other incredibly po polarizing events. And that's why you know, one, one set of standards that I think are incredibly important to complement the role of international human, human rights law and, and obviously US constitution uh, and, and, and US law in, in this country are, you know, the, there are about principles which which, which make us think not just about what is being said, but by whom it is being said, the context in which it is being said, and the likelihood that that speech will 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 lead to to, to offline harm. Now, obviously, you know, per our our, our um, community standards, if you make threatening, violent remarks against people because of their race, religion, sexual orientation, that speech will will likely be be, be, be taken down. But but we're we're also looking to make sure that our 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 enforcement and decisions about what content is and is not allowed take takes account of of, of context. Um, there may be things that you say in in the context of the current conflict in in Ethiopia, which if you if you said them in Costa Rica, might be seen in in a. a, a a, a different way. So context and who and likelihood of harm are critical questions for us to think about, as well as the actual words themselves and how and in what way they constitute hate speech. Thanks. That's that's really helpful. Um, that's really helpful context. And I, I appreciate all of that. I think that one of the things that I noticed in in both of in both of your answers is the degree to which context is is necessary to understand what is happening in a given circumstance. And in US law, for example, um, it's it's usually a court making the decision and it is a court examining, you know, the specifics of a particular incident. Um, no social media company is ever actually going to be able to, to mine that context for specific instances. And you know, so we're we're all we're almost always. <laughs> We're definitely going to have a, a significant amount of, of false positives where people are silenced um, or, or censored or otherwise or otherwise had their 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 content um, diminished in its in its reach mistakenly even by even by whatever rules the the, the social media platform comes up with and considering the kind of breadth of what we're we're facing here like we, what, as Ian pointed out we are talking about in 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 some circumstances we're talking about global companies that are trying to make decisions that are going to be very different depending on the depending on the actual global context is this something that really social media platforms should be doing should they be uh, looking into hate speech or should they be trying to come up with rules that that create the that that uh, uh, that define this concept um, and and you know prohibit it in certain ways um, or or should they or should they not even be engaging in this endeavor? I, I realize that's an even more fundamental question than what is hate speech, but I, I wondered what your thoughts were as to why it was important that they engage in it or or not. So before I answer that question, let me frame my answer to your question. Um, in the context of our human rights policy. Um, tomorrow is six months since Facebook launched its, its first ever corporate human rights policy. And in that policy, we uh, we made a whole series of commitments um, uh, around the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, which is kind of the key international standard for determining the human rights responsibilities of companies. And we also made a whole series of commitments to international standards, um, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and, and I won't bore you with a, a whole list of them all, but, but you know, what was important about this um, 
uh, about the, the 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 policy was to was an effort to situate Facebook kind of as a as a leading player in, in the tech industry in its commitment to human rights and and in the policy we not only set out kind of the standards that we we seek to uphold but we set out um, to, to, to the ways in which we seek to uphold them. So we talk specifically about three things I would mention. One is due diligence, uh, um, the, the, the work that needs to be done to assess human rights risks and to the extent possible mitigate or, 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 or avert them completely. Um, the question of remedy, and I want to come, so come back to your question about what do we do when we get it wrong, because we have a commitment to remedy, that, that if we harm people, if we harm people's human rights, we have a commitment to seek to remedy that. What does that mean? And I, I, I want to give two or three examples. Um, and then there's very specific commitments to the protection of human rights defenders, which, I mean, there are many vulnerable groups on the platform who are you know, vulnerable to hate speech and other kinds of abuse, but we've certainly singled out human rights defenders as being a group of particular import that we want to make a formal commitment to. So to answer your question, there is no question in our minds that both because of the the kind of the, the Facebook values which have long existed of you know of, of community and voice and safety and dignity and so on and our human rights policy we absolutely have um, a responsibility to seek to ensure that we are we are not used as a as, as a as a platform for hate speech violence incitement bullying harassment or other kinds of of problematic speech. You know, particularly especially when there is a risk that they will you know contribute to to to, to offline harm so our 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 commitment to address hate speech is i think is it's clear and it's very much rooted in, in our commitment to, to human rights even though the hate speech community standards predated the policy but still there's, there's no question in our mind that the human rights policy provides a critical framework and of course we get it wrong sometimes whether it's through automated enforcement or human enforcement but that's not a reason not to be doing it and certainly to be seeking to to provide remedy and happy to come and talk about that uh, uh, when when appropriate when we do get it wrong um so you raised a bunch of interesting issues there and i'm gonna pick off a few of them. Um, first, you mentioned the fact that uh, internet services often lack enough context in order to be able to situate the conversation um, in the community which is actually happening. Um, and to me, that's that's unavoidable. That's an inevitable part of the fact that we're asking internet services in a sense to act as um, a, a, a judicial type role without having the kind of evidence that we do expect in a judicial function. Um, so without that evidence, of course they're gonna get it wrong. And we don't want them to build a judicial function. It takes too long, it would be too expensive. Um, and so we just accept that they're gonna make mistakes because they don't have the context. That's that's unavoidable. And I don't view that as a failing. And I think that there's a tendency, especially among regulars say, well, if you just tried harder, you would make fewer mistakes. And really the context problem is so intractable that it's not a it's not a, a will or a commitment problem. It's, it's a information ecosystem or ecology problem. Um, the question about um, uh, do we want internet services to be regulating um, hate speech? I think it a lot depends on what we might call the level of um, the player in the stack of communications. Um, so, for example, um, we've seen efforts to deputize various players in the ecosystem to uh, enforce uh, uh, the content standards. Um, some of who are not in a great position to enforce it. So sometimes we put see pressure put on domain name registrars, or we see push pressure put on to web hosts who are simply providing um, a storage space and internet connectivity, um, or we see pressure put on internet access providers. Um, and these players aren't at the end of the conversation; they're facilitators in the middle of the conversation. And asking them to go and try and enforce hate speech rules creates a lot more risk for two reasons. One, they, they have even less context. And two is that they have, they have poor remedies to fix a problem. Uh, so it's not like Facebook has a wide panoply of remedies that they can uh, uh, deploy. Whereas uh, someone like a domain name registrar, if they try to get involved, all they can do is basically turn the switch on or off. They can either keep the domain name up or they can turn it off. Those are the only two choices. And so asking them to try and mediate the conversation with such a limited set of remedies is going to create even more problems. When we're dealing with this, the services that are uh, at the very end of enabling that conversation, like a social media service allowing its users to talk to each other, I don't even see this as a really a question. They have to regulate. Um, uh, hate speech. If they don't, 
then the the haters take over. Uh, the conversation discourse devolves to a level where no productive conversations can take place. Um, and so, uh, so it's not really a question of should they, they have to. Um, and then we have to be prepared for the fact that they're not going to get everything right. And we have to be prepared for the fact that they can't fix the structural flaws in humanity that cause us to be mean to each other. Um, and so they're going to do the best they can with the tools they've got to try and mediate a conversation to keep it from devolving into the worst of humanity. But they're never going to eliminate all things that we might call hate speech. That's unreasonable. And they're never going to get all their judgment calls right because they lack the context to do so. I, I, I agree 100 percent. And that sounds like a bleak ass assessment. But I, I do want to also kind of give a more optimistic one. I mean, if you think back to 2017, um, and the um, atrocities against the Rohingya in August of 2017 in, 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 in Myanmar. Um, Facebook was very, very criticized uh, um, uh, by many people, including by the UN fact-finding mission for the fact that we failed to, to address, to recognize and address and control hate speech on the platform addressed against the Rohingya, and that that played a role in driving the, 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 the real world harm, the, the, the offline harm that, that forced 700,000 uh, uh, into Bangladesh's refugees and saw many women raped and many killed and villages burned and, and all the rest of it. But if you look at now um, how how the, the, the platform is dealing with the situation in Myanmar, where it's going through a different human rights crisis, particularly since the, the military coup, um, in February, there's a there's a completely different approach. We've taken the Tatmadaw, the military, uh, uh, the military off the platform, citing the UN guiding principles on business and human rights as a justification for doing so. Uh, we've got a, a huge investment in automated enforcement. Uh, uh, in in uh, we, we, we've hired dozens of content moderators in all the languages spoken, and so on. You know, there've been real efforts made, including through relationships with um, human rights and civil society organisations. To 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 to, um, to address at least some of the problems and the worst problems are on the platform. Are we eliminating the the worst of human behaviour? Um, as Eric asked, cl clear, clearly not. But at least we're trying to make sure that we've learned kind of really really important lessons and and are, are trying to ensure that our platform is to the extent possible, you know, a, a, a force for good and, and not of evil. I realise that can sound very naive in a context like 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 Myanmar, but it but it speaks to to the incredibly intense efforts. That said. Um, we will make mistakes. And that's where I think just two things I'd want to mention. You know, one is the importance of the role of the oversight board. Um, it, 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 it's, um, it is a, a, an important remedy mechanism, which is very explicitly using the language of human rights in its rulings, in its decisions, in its recommendations, which is having a real impact uh, um, at the company and is, and is um, pushing real changes in policy and in, in, in how we you know, address a wide range of, of, of enforcement decisions and, and, and content issues, not just on hate speech, but, but kind of more broadly. Um, and the other thing to mention is, is the importance of our engagement with, with civil society around the world. We have almost 200 what we call trusted partners, which I mean, we, we talk to many, many NGOs and civil society groups and academics on a very regular basis. They they advise us on our development of our content policies and, and, and providing political context to countries uh, in which the platform is operating. But we also have trusted partners who have a particular role in flagging concerns in flagging problems in pointing out how certain kinds of words are, are being used in certain contexts as, as as slurs as ethnic slurs as types of hate speech and those kind of relationships are incredibly important for helping inform us and ensure that we are being as responsible as po uh, responsive as possible to the context um as we as we look to uh, 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 implement and, and, and enforce our commitment to keep hate speech off the platform Thank you. That was that for both of those answers. Those were incredibly helpful and informative. I think that um, one thing that that leads me to, especially the the, the question about the, the the raising of civil society and the idea of of kind of transparency and accountability. Um, one question that I have with respect to hate speech, and I think kind of generally. Um, is how do we ensure or encourage transparency and accountability um, in the, the process of both creation of these rules and enforcement of them, 
Um, it, it sounds like you know at least Facebook has has made some changes in the ways that that it engages on on uh, on the human rights perspective in the human rights perspective across the globe, and that's those are improvements. But we also got a report from the Wall Street Journal a couple of days ago that indicated that there are something on the order of five million or more Facebook users who qualify for a whitelisting program called Crosscheck where their content is not moderated um, in the same way that you know most Facebook user content is is moderated that the rules aren't applied in the same way. Um, I can imagine that there are other platforms who have similar rules for prominent users. How 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 do we how do we obtain the, the transparency and accountability necessary so we understand those rules and how they're being applied by the companies? Is it is it just consistent, you know, investigative reporting and civil society engagement, or are there other pathways that we should be looking into? Eric, did you want to go first? Uh, no, actually, I'd love to hear what you have to say. I'll pipe up. Look, okay, so a couple of thoughts. Look, before I joined Facebook last year, I spent the previous 20 years working for Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch. So I'm, I'm a great believer in the role of, of human rights organizations in, you know, in, in, in uncovering truth and, and, and looking at the behavior of, um, of powerful uh, entities, whether they're governments or, or, or companies, um, and similarly for for you know the, the importance of journalism and a, and a free press and the role of investigative journalism. So you know I would never want to uh, discourage human rights organisations or or journalists from from scrutinising the conduct of of companies like Facebook, which obviously are are, are very powerful and have an extraordinary capacity to sort of to determine. Um, Political discourse. I mean, you know, if you think about the the furore around decisions made by Twitter and Facebook to remove, um, suspend Donald Trump from their, or remove Donald Trump from their platforms, whether one agrees with the, those decisions or not, or whether one thinks that those decisions should have been made a long time ago, the fact is that the, these companies have an extraordinary capacity to to determine political discourse and that, that, that gives them a tremendous amount of power so external scrutiny is important but clearly also we need to ensure that we are as transparent as, as possible about both our standards um how the standards are are, are, are defined and how they're enforced and i think you know we have made good progress we, we never go as far as people want but you know there's a lot of information uh, uh on, on on the website both about the community stands a lot of detail that explains that but also the core Quarterly enforcement reports that we that, that, that we put out give a lot of information about uh, how content was and wasn't taken down, how much of it was taken down through automation, how much not. And over the next six months, we will be releasing the first of what will become our annual human rights disclosure reports. That's a commitment that we've made in our human rights policy to do an annual human rights disclosure report, where we hope that there will be an additional layer of, 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 of transparency through explaining not only the commitments to human rights that we've made in our policy, but how we've implemented it. Um, and we hope to provide quite a lot of detail about what we're doing around due diligence, what we're doing around remedy, what we're doing to protect human rights defenders, and you know what we hope to do in the future in order to strengthen our commitment to human rights and, and our capacity to uphold it. So I think you know internal work and external work are both incredibly important as we think about transparency for for what are obviously very very important and influential entities in in, in many societies around the world and i think about uh this issue about uh, both transparency and accountability as um a, a pretty dynamic one where we're still uh seeing a lot of iteration and evolution on the part of uh, internet services um, obviously big players like Facebook, but also even small players um, that uh, you may not be interacting with, but have their own niche in our society. Um, we're seeing a lot of innovation in this space. And so I feel like the story is still being written, that we're still learning from each other. What is it that we need to do internally at the internet services to best cater to the communities while balancing a lot of conflicting interests, um, as well as uh, across the industry? Um, you know, what are the best uh, uh, industry standards uh, that, um, uh, that we can adopt um, and learn from each other and say, you know what, this works um, to solve this problem or this doesn't work and don't try and uh, uh, try it yourself. Um, so 
for me, I think, you know, uh, if you take a snapshot and say, have we achieved the kind of transparent, transparency and accountability that we hope for in our society? I think most of us say no, but I think it'd be a mistake to assume that we've finished the story development. And so, you know, I think that's where your question, uh, Kate, really raises, what more do we need to do to help advance this story? Um, there's no doubt that we've seen the effect of civil society in pressuring internet services to improve their practices. Um, what I'm, what I haven't been able to wrap my head around is how do we get more of those voices sitting at the table in the decision making uh, process within the companies, so that uh, we can have the companies better anticipate these issues um, uh, rather than wait for them to come out and then to get the, all the pressure from civil society or investigative journalism or government. Um, uh, you know, having people like Ian uh, internal to Facebook, I think, is a, a movement in that direction. Um, but there's so many different voices that need to be at the table. And I don't know how the internet services are going to accommodate uh, that. But but I think there's no doubt they have to do better um, uh, on that front. Um, in terms of the uh, the the fast lanes for influential figures, I just want to point out two things. One, um, for me, it's really really damaging to have. Uh, the, um, uh, the, 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 the people with the biggest voices held to lesser standards, because those are the people who are, by definition, more influential, more likely to set community norms. They should be held to a higher standard, not a lower standard. Um, so for me, I don't really understand that entire model, um, but I think it's kind of a reification of power in our society generally. The powerful people get, get more preferential rules, and uh, we see that in every internet service as well. Um, but I do want to point out one class of powerful people who do get preferential treatment all the time that don't have any accountability or transparency in their efforts to do so. And that's the government. The government leans on their own services all the time and says, could you just do us this favor? Um, and it's those requests that we don't really have great visibility into what's being asked um, and how it's being responded. The transparency reports don't fully answer these questions. Um, and the government is always the one that has the biggest stick. They have a way bigger stick than civil society or investigative journalists have. Um, so when the government makes these kinds of requests and favors, um, to me, that's actually a system defect. And that's the thing that I want to figure out how we can better curb. Can I just... I, I was just going to piggyback off of that and see if you had anything to offer about how, about the international perspective there and the ways that other governments might be engaging in similar... So yeah, so just a couple of thoughts. Firstly, I I, I didn't answer the question about uh, the Wall Street Journal article and the and the um, the cross checks and those with with um, yeah the, the blue ticks. And obviously, it raises a, a whole series of, of criticisms. You know, some of which Facebook has 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 acknowledged, and as I think has been pointed out, a lot of the criticism actually has come from Facebook's own criticism of the system. But just a couple of things to say about about that. Um, there is no difference in the rules that are applied to different actors. Um, the fact that one is cross-checked, because one is, one is a VIP, and I'll say more about that in a second, doesn't mean that you have different rules to play by. It just means that there is a, a greater degree of scrutiny to, re, to ensure that the, the right decisions are, are being made. Now, in some cases, there's no question, that led to delays in decisions being made, and that, and that is a problem. Justice delayed is justice denied, as, as we all know. Um, but the rules are the same. The, and then the other point to make is that cross-check people are not necessarily the most powerful. In, in some instances, we cross-check human rights defenders and investigative journalists precisely because they're not the most powerful, precisely because they are the most likely to be abused online. And we want to make sure that we know who they are. And we want to, uh, to, to, to uh, and, and we fear that their accounts may be uh, um, uh, uh, vulnerable to being compromised, to being hacked, or that governments may seek to discredit them in an effort to silence their voices. And in the past, we may have made mistakes because we allowed complaints to be made against human rights defenders, something they may have said that, that led us to take action against their accounts, and we want to actually provide more effective protection. So the cross-check system is a, is a useful one for a range of, of, of actors and, and, not, and not just the most powerful. Um, I mean, in terms of the role of governments, yes, and we could spend hours talking about this. And let me just say in, in, a, in a couple of sentences, I mean, there are real concerns around the world at ways in which governments are using uh, um, the language of, of, of hate speech and fake news and misinformation as a pretext. And we've seen this a lot during COVID, obviously, as, as more people's lives have, have, have gone on online in particular. But we've seen governments, you know, 
introducing regulations and legislation that that seeks to limit the ability of social media companies to um, to protect human human rights online. So either in some cases they're trying to repress speech online, particularly repress any kind of criticism, uh, and and they will order uh, uh, often with threats of of fines and criminal liability for individual staff members. They will order. Uh, um, uh, social media platforms to take down content which should be allowed to be up because it's a, it's a manifestation of freedom of expression even if it's critical of the government. In other cases as we saw with an effort by the president of, of Brazil just in the last few days um, he, he issued an executive order which tried to prevent social media platforms from taking down content that could constitute hate speech or, or misinformation um, because he's trying to limit our ability to keep certain problematic co uh, uh, content off the platforms. So we're seeing uh, there's a lot of discussion in this country about Section 230 and what Congress should or should not do about it. But around the world, there are enormous issues around governments who are not uh, looking to apply human rights principles as they look at uh, regulation of, of social media content. A follow-up to that, to that, to to your last comment, then is um, do are are there are there are there standards that exist that help that help or could exist that help um, social media companies resist pressure from certain governments to to censor to censor speech or har that would harm um, you know human rights workers and and dissidents. So we're, we're a member of, of the GNI, the Global Network Initiative, which is um, which brings together uh, tech companies and human rights groups around protecting freedom of expression and, and privacy online. And there are a series of, of, of rules and standards and commitments that we have to live up to as part of the GNI, um, which which you know which exists to protect the rights of of, of users. Um, you know, and sometimes we'll get a takedown request from our government. Uh, uh, when we do, you know, we need to assess that in the light of our commitments uh, under human rights law um, and our human rights policy and, and to our, you know, to GNI commitments. And, and yes, yeah, so these are important standards um, to help uh, try and ensure that we um, are able to push back against, against government pressure to restrict uh, freedom of expression of online users. And, and I think GNI is great, but I don't I don't think it answers all the questions that we need to answer. And I think, Aaron, uh, Kate, you really um, like, uh, just ask really, I think this the most central question uh, for the future of the internet, um, which is we should assume that governments, if given the flexibility to do so, will engage in sensorial efforts. Um, and things like hate speech as a category of antisocial content is, as Ian explained, a great tool for governments to deploy their sensorial ag agenda while having this fig leaf or this um, veneer of complying with the rule of law. Um, there was a time when the United States actually was a, a leader on this front and actually going around the globe and trying to push back on repressive governments and saying that their efforts were not consistent with our understandings about civil rights and civil liberties. Um, but in the United States, we're fighting the, whole, the same battle here. And in fact, uh, we have two states, Florida and Texas, that passed laws that restricted the ability of internet services to fight against hate speech. So we have no more moral standing in the globe and we're not even trying. Um, so who is going to push back against government's rapacious demands to engage in censorship? Answer, we as the citizens are the only ones who have the chance and we don't have enough power to fight the government on that front. So this is, I think, the reason why the entire fate of the internet is really hanging in the balance on this very question. If we cannot figure out a way to fight back against government censorship using something that sounds good, like fights against hate speech, um, the governments will win that battle and they will de decide what we can say to each other in ways that will not be advantageous to us as citizens. I'm not sure I can add anything to that besides I completely agree. Um, Ian, did you have a response or anything to add on to what Professor Goldman just said other than just nodding? Yeah, that's, um, it, it's 12.44, so I didn't know if we wanted to turn to, to questions from the audience. Yep, uh, thanks so much for blogging that. And uh, yeah, we do have a couple of questions from the audience and can open up to uh, open up the questions. I can read them out if that's easier. 
for you all. Um, so the first question that we received is from Jaren Jenkins. Um, the question is, do we think there are groups that should be protected that currently aren't protected by social networks? I believe this would be more towards um, Ian. Um, for example, the unhoused community. Thanks for the question. So one of the things that the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights um, tell us as, you know, as we think about our human rights responsibility as, as a company is the importance of identifying salient risks, the, 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 the most critical risks. It means, and we need to look at scale, scope, and remedi remediability of human rights harms. We know, who's affected, how many people are affected, how are they affected, what kinds of, of their rights are, are being violated and, and, and what can be done to address it. So, so you know, absolutely thinking about um, those, those communities who are being most harmed online um, and what needs to be done to address it is, is a critical responsibility we have as we think about living up to our human rights commitments. And obviously that will depend on time and place. Um, and it, it usually means, not always, but it usually means racial and religious minorities, women, um, LGBTQ uh, communities, people with disabilities, human rights defenders, um, opposition activists, uh, you know, obviously it, it, it will vary. But, but there's no question that as we think about protecting people from hate speech and other kinds of problematic speech, you know, violence, incitement and bullying and harassment and so on. It's vital that in our analysis of, of what's going on in, in any particular situation that we are very uh, uh, conscious of um, the, the those communities who, who are being most who are being most affected, who are most vulnerable to harm, that we're engaging with them. And I think the point that was made earlier about the importance of ensuring the representation of, of some of the most dispossessed voices engaging in, engaging with us, making sure that we listen to them and hear them and hear their concerns about about where where we're failing them. Um, it's absolutely essential if we're going to do our job of living up to uh, commitment to human rights and to preventing um, online hate. So uh, abs absolutely right. Um, you know, and one thing, and, and this is back, we've, we've done this a little bit, but certainly one of the things that I, I hope we'll do more of going forward is kind of, you know, co-design with affected communities. Um, in her report last year, uh, to the UN Human Rights Council, the UN Special Rapporteur on Racism and Racial Discrimination, who was looking at the uh, at emerging digital technologies and and their impact on on, on racial discrimination, you know, urged that um, uh, all all tech companies designing different kinds of new technologies kind of ensured that they engaged with uh, uh, different communities of of of, of color of different ethnicity to to look at before before launching products to look at their potential impact we know you know for example that surveillance ai surveillance is is very problematic from a, a race and racial discrimination perspective so so building that into the development and ensuring that a due diligence is done around potential impact on different communities particularly the most vulnerable and dispossessed communities is a, is a critical responsibility we have if I can add just, uh, this is, I think, directly responsive to the question asked earlier about the role of civil society. This is absolutely a place where um, having organizations that can call attention to um, uh, to problems that are being created in the community um, can raise awareness. And so um, that's not the only answer, but this is a great example of a place where um, those uh, communities that aren't getting uh, the justice they deserve um, uh, can actually uh, uh, advance their issue better. I do want to continue to kind of push on the need for transparency, however, in these in these in these discussions, because the I, I agree with flexible rules. I agree with trying with trying to identify marginalized communities and, and the most dispossessed among us and focusing on their needs. Um, but when we're creating these things, there's also the possibility for people of power to come in and make for groups of power to come in and make similar requests for themselves. And we need to know if that is happening and the degree to which, for example, there are special rules being created to protect the police, which I do know some, some social media companies had special rules to protect police from quote unquote doxing. Um, and, that, and that made it harder for using, that made it harder for people to use those platforms to call out those police officers for engaging in, um, for engaging in repressive behavior to marginalized communities. So that we need transparency and consistent accountability and consistent discussion with, with social media platforms 
so that we don't uh, so that we don't create circumstances where um, groups with a ton of power, like the police, are claiming to be dispossessed and getting and getting special treatment as well. Thank you to all of you for answering that question, and providing your input. I think it's really important. Like data governance is um, especially important since it can exacerbate a lot of the inequality, whether it's socioeconomic inequality or um, or just power inequality as well, and just um, exacerbate that dynamic. So it's um, just really important to constantly kind of check and and keep every all the all the different stakeholders accountable in the space. Um, moving on to the next question. Uh, so next is from Jess Myers. Um, so the question is standards development was mentioned. Um, what orgs, groups, uh, or current initiatives would you highlight in this space that are doing content standards development work on this hate speech or extremist content uh, besides GIFCT? In other words, who should industry be propping up and working closely with? So could you say the question again? I didn't. I wasn't sure if I understood it correctly. It was which group should we be working with in the as as content standards are developed? Uh, yeah. So who should industry be propping up and working closely with when uh, developing these standards? I mean, certainly Gift CT is a good example of, of a group that we've, um, uh, you know, that I think is playing a really important role in 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 addressing um, you know online approaches to counterterrorism and, and and human rights and trying to sort of create more consistent approaches ac across the industry and engaging very closely with NGOs, human rights groups and, and so on. I think that, that that's a good example. I was, I, I, as I mentioned, I think it ha 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 has an important role to play. Um, I was actually thinking less of kind of coalition groups and just more broadly, you know, when we when we develop our, you know, our community standards, um, uh, and revise them, and and uh, you know, with, with, with on a very frequent basis, we're engaging with a, a wide variety of um, civil society groups, um, you know, specialists and experts in particular areas. You know, it may be on public health issues, it may be around human rights issues, it may be on environmental issues. Um, so it's it's hard to sort of single out individual groups. It's 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 you know, it, we look very broadly both uh, to academia as well as to kind of think tanks and policy groups and activist groups to try and get inputs as we uh, as we do sort of development of our community standards and, and thinking about uh, about content moderation um, it's, it's a very it's a very broad range of actors I'm sorry that's not a very satisfactory answer but but it genuinely is a, a really broad range of actors that, that we're engaging with really on a daily basis um, I just want to make sure I there may be some audience members who are not aware of GIFT CT, and I think it's actually quite relevant to our conversation here. I'm just going to say a few more words about them. Uh, GIFT CT is a global internet forum to counteract uh, or combat terrorism. Um, and it's basically a block list where uh, identified items of uh, terroristic content are hashed, and then uh, that hash list is shared with other uh, internet services to identify uh, those uh, items of content and block them. Um, and to Kate's point, this is a great example where we have very little transparency about the work that it's doing. So we don't really know exactly what items are on that list, how they got onto the list, and whether or not they should be properly on that list. We also don't have clear mechanisms for getting items off that list if they are in fact improper. Um, and so GIFCT is actually, I think, part of the problem, not part of the solution. I mean, I think there's a ton of really good research being done out there. I would look to um, the Borkman Klein Center at Harvard that's led by Joan Donovan. Um, the work of the Center for Democracy and Technology, they examine content moderation practices all the time, as does the Open Technology Institute. I think those are all places that, that at least in the United States, companies should be going to, to mine their expertise and understand how things should be done better. Also, we have the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Great. Um, cool. Ian, were you going to jump in and add anything to that? OK, cool. Um, in that case, uh, yeah, thank you for chiming in. I'll move to the next question. The next question asks, since hate speech is not well-defined, as mentioned 
uh, who should be assigned this role to actually define it well. I mean, I can tell you who I don't want to do it. <laughs> I, I, I think that's the problem, right? right? The, who would, who could the entire globe trust to determine what is and is, and is not hate speech? Um, and the answer to me is certainly not any any particular government, as we've as we've already talked about on this on this call. The the government will use hate speech as a as a ruse for suppressing ideas that it disagrees with, and that's pretty much across the board. And it will use it to harm, and governments will use it to harm um, dissidents and marginalized communities in ways that are incredibly problematic. So what do we do? Um, I, I don't I don't have a good answer except that we are building systems now that are attempting to um, address this problem and we're starting to think about it a little bit differently. We are approaching um, content moderation generally as as something that we understand has an error rate and that we understand we have we have to make decisions about um, you know which direction we want the errors to go in. How much automated decision making can be used, and in which context is it appropriate for it to be used? And then, what are the processes that need to exist after after it is used to ensure that you know we're getting we're getting as much accountability and transparency in the process as we can? Um, so I I don't know that I trust a single actor, but I do think that the role of civil society, the role that civil society can play, and that experts can play, and that professors can play in conversation with the social media platforms is the way forward. Yeah, it's a it's a great question, and I and I likewise don't have an answer. You know, I, I was looking this morning just as I was sort of preparing for this discussion and thinking about you know the key issues. I took a quick look at the UN Secretary General's Strategy and Plan of Action on Hate Speech because you know the UN Secretary General maybe that's a good place to start if we're thinking about creating an international consensus on what is hate speech and what should we do about it. And practically the first thing it says in the, in the, in the strategy and plan of action is there is no consensus on what hate speech is. Um, and I was trying to imagine the UN system in its current state um, as, as, a, as an actor that could help lead the discussion on creating a consensus. And I can't imagine it. I mean, the UN system currently is so divided and arguably dysfunctional over such fundamental issues um, on so many levels. And the, and the permanent fire of the Security Council has such loggerheads on so many things. Even the UN human rights, I just can't imagine it. So I, I don't know. And I think, as Kate says, I, I, think, I think that thinking that we're moving towards a global consensus on what hate speech is, is probably a waste of time. What we need to be doing is engaging in so many different ways across uh, uh, civil society groups and social media companies and, and, and academics and others to be constantly thinking about how do we deal with it, how do we prevent it, how do we content moderate it, while accepting that we will never actually define it in a way that all of us agree. Um, uh, and so I think we have to refine what we and improve on what we're currently doing. I, I don't see a different kind of model that will allow one definition that we all kind of recognize and, uh, and acknowledge. It just doesn't seem feasible. I can just add to that. I agree with that. And especially I want to come back to, I think, what Kate uh, started us with, this issue about context, um, that um, hate speech is context dependent. And so really, I think the idea of having this un this monolithic definition of hate speech that everyone would agree upon and that all services would apply equally, I don't think really makes sense. And so for me, um, each service should define hate speech for its own service, which what Facebook has done. He started us off with that um, uh, point about how Facebook was defining it. Um, and I'm fine with Facebook's definition and I'm fine with other services defining it differently. And to me, I think then each service should define it for their community, having the context that's available to them and trying to shape the kind of conversation that they're hoping to shape. Um, and so I think if we can get away from the idea that there's a single uniform definition of hate speech and everyone should fall in line behind it, actually the answer is quite obvious. Each service should define for themselves. They should uh, take proactive efforts to uh, enforce that definition or else the haters win. Um, and we then as uh, as uh, community members should respect the fact that not everyone's gonna see it the same way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I know we're at 
uh, close to time, just a minute left. Um, so unfortunately, we'll not be able to get to the rest of the questions. Um, sorry about that. Feel free to send over some questions to me and can pass them to the, the speakers um, to get their input. Um, other than that, thank you so much for to the speakers for joining. Thank you to our sponsors. Uh, TikTok, Zuljin, and Microsoft for sponsoring this event. And uh, today's uh, event was focused on hate speech, uh, hate speech moderation. We discussed a lot about um, how to define hate speech, who we don't want to define hate speech, which is, um, we mentioned a lot about governments defining it. And the next uh, panel will be completely focused on what then the government's role is in content moderation. Um, where is it that some of our current policies say, specifically in the, uh, the US um, are they're performing or failing in tackling some of the fundamental issues uh, around uh, content governance. We will have some great speakers, including uh, former UN uh, Special Rapporteur, David Kay, um, who Ian has mentioned a few times today. And uh, we'll have a great conversation coming up uh, around what um, kind of, I guess taking a step back from uh, platform focused and moving more towards the role of the government um, around moderating and at keeping uh, platforms accountable. But again, thank you so much to Kate, Ian and Eric for joining us today. And thank you to um, everyone in the audience for joining. Yeah, uh, feel free to um, you know, register for the uh, rest of our panel and you will also find the recording for this as well as all the other uh, panels in our YouTube channel um, once you've um, registered. So uh, yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Thank you.